You're listening to Radio Free Satan. Enjoy the show. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to Nine Cents, a satanic perspective of our modern world. This is FXT sitting in with your host, Adam Campbell. It's great to have you. It's March 4th, and we have a great show for you this week. FXT, thank you so much for joining me, man. I got a very special treat. So I'm going to have a friend of the show, FXT, here, and we're going to be doing a little bit of a host, co-host, uh, back-and-forth banter during the first uh, three-fourths of this entire episode, actually. Um, FXT just came over, we were having a couple homebrews, uh, he made me some amazing burgers, um, my family really enjoyed, but we kicked them out of the house, literally, <laughs> so that we can record this podcast. I felt a little guilty myself, but <laughs> it was one of those days for the kids, you know. You know, I mean, after you head home, I'm going to be blaming you entirely for that. <laughs> just, it's alright. Just, you know. Hence, you know. Scapegoat. We're all used to that, right? A Satanist. Like, it was him. It was yeah. Satanist. He did it. So, if you don't remember, and you haven't um, been active on these social networking sites, uh, FXD himself is actually a musician of sorts. He has a couple projects out. Scapegoat is one of them, and uh, Zodiac, correct? Z- Zodiac. The, other. the one everybody hates. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um... Scapegoat I've been doing since, uh, both of them actually, since the early 90s. Scapegoat is dark ambient music, um, really inspired by Lustmore and some other artists. And then Zodiac is just kind of like a hard techno thing, which everybody except for people in Eastern Europe seem to really <laughs> loathe and despise. Yeah. So, hey, you know. We are going to do a regular show here this week. We're going to be talking about uh, the regular format that we have always done, uh, just with uh, another perspective, another Satanist in the mix here. So, first of all, let's talk about the week. Uh, I do want to say thank you very much, Azazel, Azazel, uh, Azazel, I I don't know how the hell you say it, but uh, he gave me a really great review on uh, iTunes, and I do truly appreciate it. I've I've been talking to him a little bit online, and uh, thank you very much for listening to the show, man, and thank you for your support, thank you for spreading the word. And for the rest of you out there, if you haven't gone to iTunes um, and uh, rated and reviewed, well, I understand why you haven't. But if you're going to be there at any point anyway, I would certainly appreciate the review. It allows the show to be exposed to other people via the recommendations or people who have listened to this also have downloaded this section of it. And, uh, you know, as I see it, and it's entirely self-serving, the more people that hear the show, the better. So uh, it's all for exposure and uh, for spreading the word about uh, what Satanism really is and uh, not so much what the bullshit is. Uh, anything you have? Some interesting characters you have on once in a while. <laughs> Indeed. And especially tonight's guest, too. I don't know her personally, <laughs> but uh, just from what I know on Facebook, really anybody, anybody from the Church of Satan, or even just friends of people in the Church of Satan, are just really interesting and just always interesting to get to know. Everybody's multifaceted in their talents. Like, everybody's either a DJ and or a writer or a musician or an artist <laughs> of some kind, so it's, it's awesome. You know, how many... You know, Catholic people, like, do all of these things. Maybe that's generalizing, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Satanists are just multi-talented, and they're more interesting by far than, you know... I absolutely agree. Most you people. know, one thing that I did make a note of a little while ago, um, it actually might have been the last episode, too, was that the idea that because we are the way we are, because we're Satanists, because... you know. It's not necessarily because we're Satanists that we do these things, but because we're this type of person, this sort of renaissance human being, that's maybe why we're Satanists. It's that idea that we we have our fingers in a lot of different Renaissance things. human being, I like. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's really what we are as... And I would... I mean, this is a little absurd to say, but we're like our own little species because we don't always agree with each other on everything. We're, we're, we're definitely not the same type of a person... Uh, as the herd, hence we step outside of it and we point at them as the herd. But, you know, 
you can meet a lot of religious people who have no talent at all and they just spout the Bible. I have never met a Satanist who has not been amazing at something or, or, or really great at something. Like, there's always a passion in their life. And that's something that I think, you know, you just don't find everywhere else. That's kind of the point of it, I think, is that's what draws people to it, is uh, not being so mundane or like, you know, yeah. having, I, you know, everybody does something and those who aren't maybe artists or whatever are good at something, like you were saying, and it just seems like they're drawn to being a part of that elite group who are Satanists. Yeah. Really, I mean that's what it's all about for me too. It's not like saying I'm not a religious person. I'm not a Catholic. I'm one of these guys. That's not what it's about. It's more like I'm into this. I'm into that. And I'm into these and those. And the only place where everybody's into that is over with these guys on this far left corner over here. It's really dark <laughs> and shady. And there's there's yeah. always <laughs> box uh, Takata and Few playing in the background. Da 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 da. All right, so we do have a regular show, like I said before. Uh, in The Devil's Advocate, we're going to be talking about lesser magic, knowing your place. And this is something I was thinking about the other day, um, and it, it's sort of one of those ideas that has helped me individually, and I hope maybe if I can if I can articulate it, it could help you as well with your lesser magic workings. In Infernal Informant, we're going to be talking uh, an article here, Breitbart's Culture War Ends. And Ohio school shooting victims. And this is actually about the uh, recent shooting in Ohio. And actually, during this last week, I had this uh, horrid urge to go off on a rant about Breitbart. And I think I might go off on it still, but it may be a little lessened because I have someone else here with me. I might be a little awkward screaming at the top of my lungs when someone else is sitting next to me. Go right ahead. (laughs) Uh, And then in Creature Feature, as alluded earlier... I have Witch Sarah Rung with uh, The Still Show. Now, uh, Sarah Rung is an amazing woman. You're going to find out during the interview. Uh, Really interesting. But The Still Show, her uh, online sort of marketplace uh, of the bizarre, the macabre, the interesting, uh, is certainly original. Uh, you can't really fit it into a category because she has her fingers in a lot of different projects, different styles of projects, kind of like what we were just talking about a second ago. So look forward to that in the last half of the show, uh, and that's going to do it for another uh, show. So sit back, hold tight, another Devil's Advocate and Nine Cents starts now. Why bother? How you done? Great. Let's cut the bullshit and get real. Why this purity you feel about evil? For Christ's sake, why? It don't lie to me. I guess, Father. You gotta feel that old nick in your soul, and it becomes clear. Like it did for me, the first time. That's when I realized my one true calling in life. And what's that? Shit, man. (laughs) I'm a born devil's advocate. Welcome to the devil's advocate. I'm a Satanist. I'm a member of the Church of Satan. But I do not speak for the Church of Satan. That is all. All right, so lesser magic we're going to be talking about here. And I, one of the things that's sort of, as I see it, central about Satanism is it's, it's in really creative way of, of recognizing what magic is. It's separating it into lesser and greater forms and the expression of those forms. And I've talked briefly in the past and in depth on my Greater Magic episode last Halloween uh, about Greater Magic... And I've touched a little bit on some lesser magic uh, topics. Today I'm going to be talking about knowing your place and how it's sort of helped me. And and please chime in uh, if you have anything specific to this um, as I'm going. But what I mean by knowing your place is that as as human beings in the society we live in, 
and maybe just as our, our nature itself, we like to categorize people. We like to categorize uh, by income, by even religion, by uh, ethnicity, um, intellect. And certainly as Satanists we do it because we separate ourselves from the herd and, and we see ourselves as the alien elite. So I'm not, I'm not saying this as uh, uh, condemnation or anything, just as a matter of fact. Because we separate ourselves... There are expectations that come when you meet someone. So in this example, I'm going to talk specifically about a working environment where you have a a boss who employs X number of people and he expects certain things from them, uh, one, because of the role that he hired them to perform, but also because of the the role that he sees them in society. So specifically with me, uh, I work in an advertising agency, um... I am in a graphic designer role, and my uh, financial uh, category is far below (laughs) my employer's. Uh, That is to say, he is what you would call the upper 1%, and I am very much um, middle class, or I would like to think upper middle class, but really just middle class um, as far as numbers go. So when he speaks to me, there are expectations of uh, addressing him. And, and this may be something that I picked up specifically when I was in the military because it's really defined there with your, um, your rank. But um, I, think it, I think it carries through in uh, the civilian world we live in as well, where when someone talks to you and they see themselves as a higher class than you are, they expect you to address them in a certain way, treat them with a certain amount of respect, uh, or, or just you know, treat them better than you would maybe another peer or someone that you perceived as below your your status or station. I know all too well where this is going. <laughs> I have the same issue, uh, if we call it an issue, at my work too. So it's hard to do if you uh, maybe don't totally respect someone, you know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like I have a hard time calling someone yeah. a sir or deferring to them when not let's just say that they have certain habits or just you know they're not better you know what i mean yeah absolutely as just an average person that's hard to do but as somebody who's a proud arrogant satanist (laughs) and sometimes i worry if i'm a little bit over the top for even that for some people but it's really hard to swallow your pride and just say good evening sir and yes you're right and there's a (laughs) way to do it with a certain what's the word uh humor in your voice that maybe they don't detect or a certain sarcasm or you know a sardonic attitude but uh yeah i think this is probably maybe where you're headed a little bit here or? yeah for sure what and one thing i learned early and this is specifically in the military um is it was called diplomacy when i was doing it is that you would you'd speak to a superior officer because of rank they're superior and and time and grade or whatever but you would have to address them with the respect that they that they expected and doing that allows you the power of saying whatever you want to say as long as you say it in the manner that they're expecting. You can openly insult them. You can tell them straight up the truth as you perceive it, especially if it's against their um, way of thinking or their uh, expectation of the way you're thinking. And by doing that, you actually put yourself in, in, in this is just my experience, in a position of power that raises your status. You suddenly are no longer one of the herd just because you played their game, just because you were aware of it and you knowingly played into their hand what they wanted you to do at that time or maybe daily. And by doing that, you put yourself into their confidence, you put yourself into their their circle of trust, and that is how you can really... Uh, use them and their power to your advantage. It sounds like if you play their game, what you're saying, because I had this exact thing happen to me <laughs> at my job. Um, I work in a restaurant. I'm the night manager there. And I work with people who I don't think less of them, like in terms of like I hate them or anything like that, but they, let's just say they have habits where they think they're really above everybody because they're in the management, because they're owning or running the restaurant but I'm the guy who actually comes in in the middle of the afternoon and I've got all these kids that I have to round up and have them do this or that at the end of the night I'm the guy who's cutting the food for the people putting on their plates and they're watching me do it it's an open air kitchen 
I have to control like the servers, the people behind the house, the kitchen staff. And at the end of the night, I lock up. I do everything, you know, yeah. and I know that I'm pretty much one of the life horses of that restaurant. And it used to be that I would lock horns with people on all of these different issues, and we'd disagree, and I would just get mad, and I'd tell them off, and they'd tell <laughs> me off, and I'd get myself in trouble. It wasn't until I finally figured out, shut up. <laughs> you know, think what you think, but just don't tell them that. Yeah. That way, they and just kind of give them like not a compliment necessarily per se, but like just go along with what what Adam was just saying. Just do what they say, play it their way for a while, but offer some opinions, you know, if if it's warranted in the situation. And then by that, you sort of put yourself into good graces, you know, do a favor here and there, like cover somebody on a shift or whatnot, or do some work for them ahead of time to get them ahead of the game for the next yeah. day. And you'd be amazed. And by doing that, I was, again, the scapegoat. <laughs> you know, at the restaurant where I just could not do anything right. Every week I was in trouble. I'd be arguing with people, just locking horns, and just like really just pissed off all the time. And I finally learned to just kind of play their game a little bit, give them a little, but then take a little. And that's kind of how you do it. And that is, in a way, it's kind of uh, a form of magic, really. Once you control your emotions and all that, then it's easier to get what you want from them. And it's ever since then I've been okay. I haven't had issues. I'm no longer the the whipping boy yeah. at the restaurant. So, and there there is a distinct difference between knowing that you're doing it and just doing it because you're a weak person or you don't have a spine. Because when you're knowing you're doing it, you're using that authority that you're given, or that even that you're sometimes you're trading away. To benefit you. And if you're just cowing down, then you're never getting anything out of it. You're just being beaten down. And if you don't look at the long term, if you don't go into this knowing what you're doing, acknowledging that you're doing it for a specific reason, well, then it, you know you are really just being one of the weak-minded herd and just doing what you're told in a job. But you have to realize that, that to have a successful career... To be successful at virtually anything in life, you have to do it with your head above water. You have to be able to see the long term and what understand what you have to do in order to get there. And sometimes that means playing people and playing into their expectations of you. Not all the time, but sometimes you do have to do that. And, and it really depends on maybe the manager that you have or the specific uh, maybe it's even just a cop that pulled you over. As long as you play into their hand of what their expectations of you are, as long as you know what your expected place is in their eyes, have a little bit of perspective here, it's key to being a Satanist, then you can use that to your advantage. And this is just one little tiny, tiny little aspect of the entire process of, of lesser magic, but it is a key one. You have to know where you are in other people's eyes. Uh, very important. Not as important as knowing where you are in your own, having a realistic world view of yourself, but certainly it will serve you in the long run. Uh, and I think that's all I really want to talk about in there. A little brief overview, you know. <laughs> Let's do a little infernal informant. Listen up, listen up, Jay Yell Valley. Good news, there's no devil. Bad news, hell, no heaven. Nothing to see. Um, your informant. Uh, okay, so this article is a Chicago Tribune. Breitbart's culture war ends. Civility, accuracy, accountability. No, always a big deal for him. I think they meant not. There, not no. <laughs> it looks like it. I'm reading that one of what they're trying to say. Uh, and this is, it looks like Clarence Page on March 4th. Speak no ill of the dead. So goes a saying from ancient Greece. I must beg for an exception in the case of the late Andrew Breitbart. Like Donald Trump, Breitbart has a sweet spot and a gentle side. That's not what made him interesting. The internet news entrepreneur and right-wing political activist, who I interviewed several times, died Thursday, apparently of a heart attack at age 43. He leaves a mixed legacy with his self-described citizen journalism, got the story right, he demonstrated the web's ability to empower people previously frozen out of the mainstream media spotlight. When he got the story wrong, he showed how much more responsibility the new information age puts on new news consumers to figure out what they're being informed when they're being informed, and when they're being bamboozled. Breitbart made himself matter by using the web with a frat 
boy zest to drive a conservative message and embarrass liberal targets. Most prominently was Republican <laughs> Representative Anthony Weiner. The New York Democrat was driven out of office with his Twitter tweeted cheesecake photos of himself were revealed on Breitbart's news sites. Breitbart's biggest coup was to take down Acorn, an alliance of community development organizations in poor neighborhoods. Over his websites and Fox News, the rising web mogul publicized the videos of James O'Keefe, a young conservative who visited Acorn offices posing as a pimp. The videos appeared to show Acorn staffers advising O'Keefe how to best report income from child prostitutes on his tax returns. At least some of O'Keefe's videos later proved to be bogus, cleverly edited to give a false appearance of illegal activity. But by then, Acorn had lost its federal support and reputation and closed up shop. Sometimes, Breitbart used his money and his media merely to make a point in an activist style that would have made old-school yellow journalists smile. Some members of the Congressional Black Caucus charged that Tea Party protesters had called them the N-word near the Capitol in March 2010. Breitbart offered a reward of $100,000 to be donated to the United Negro College Fund if anyone produced a video and audio evidence that the charge was true. No one claimed the money, and Breitbart claimed victory. Episodes like these left him loved or reviled, depending on your point of view. The ill speaking after his death was robust in the Twitter universe, with various off-color ways of delivering expressions of good riddance, and less printable send-offs. Shocked? Many see it as payback for Breitbart's own memorial tweet of the late Senator Edwards Kennedy, whom he called a villain and a special pile of human excrement. Civility was not always a big deal for Andrew. By comparison, former NAACP chairman Julian Bond's post-mortem comment that he emailed to me among the emails from other acquaintances sounded like almost mild the death of Andrew Breitbart. Bond wrote, disproves the adage that only the good die young. <laughs> the civil rights community has bitter memories of a story Breitbart got wrong. The video he posted of Shirley Sherrod, an agriculture department official, because she appeared to be advocating anti-white racism in an NAACP conference. When the entire speech was viewed, it turned out to be quite the opposite, a poignant plea against racism of any kind. To me, it was a lesson for Breitbart and other New Age journalists. Respect old-school media values like accuracy and accountability, despite your skepticism about old-school media. Our first mission, whether in old or new media, is to help clear up the public's confusion, not add to it. Yet, an unapologetic Breitbart was determined to rewrite the traditional standards of accountability, too. When we last talked a m few months back, he still wanted an apology from the Black Caucus by remaining unapologetic about his own unfairness to Sherrod. Instead, he was trying to sell me on this new suspicions after her long-time activism to win back payments from the Department of Agriculture for Black Farmers. I listened politely, but he had... A lot more suspicions than evidence. Journalism can be frustrating. At least Sherrod, whose defamation suit against Breitbart is still working its way through the courts, expressed no ill will for the dead. In a statement, she sent her prayers and condolences to Breitbart's family. So do I. All right, that's the article. And I actually brought this up not to defend Breitbart or necessarily to condone his actions in life. Uh, he was an activist and... and what I brought this up for was the idea that once someone dies, you have to somehow pay lip service to their memory. As if all of the shitty things that they did in their life are going to be erased because of a pleasant eulogy. Or because no one wants to speak ill of those who did bad things in life. Because they're dead. Somehow, what, I, I don't understand. Is that going to like like reflect back on them? Like they they. And here's the other thing: is that detractors say that it's speaking ill will, and in reality, it's just you giving your opinion about someone's actions in life, the the legacy that they're leaving behind based on their own actions. So it's not like they're making anything up. And in Breitbart's case specifically, this was a political activist who was not a news member, who was not a media trusted source. He admitted to exaggeration, to hyperbole, to making shit up in order to make a point because he perceived that's what the other side was doing. 
He admitted to the other side's ability to manipulate hearts and minds, and so he went out of his way to do it himself. Now, this does not make him a trusted source of information. This makes him an activist, and any activist plays solely on their perspective. And as Satanists, we know that it is more important than anything to have perspective in our world. There is no such thing as black and white, and Breitbart was trying to prove that there was. And here's my problem with that. And this really goes to the core of everything that I talk about on this show. It's the fact that there are people in our world telling us that this is right and this is wrong. Their perspective, no matter how absurd or imaginary, a guy in the clouds that's always broke, for example, <laughs> that, that, that is what we should all accept as a worldview. That that is the only truth. And specifically, he was pushing this Christian right agenda through the Republican Party. Everything he did was really to push the right's um, uh, political power and to really shut down the left. Now, I mean, this show really isn't right or left. I mean, I, I shit on both sides, situation dependent. But in this case, especially when it comes to the religious right, I think it's always wrong. There should never be. I mean, that's really what America is about, is, is uh, protection, the right to believe whatever you want to believe. Protection from religion when the, when the circumstance demands it. And in Bryce Bird's case, it always demanded it. And everything he did, it didn't matter what religious viewpoint, what, what moral authority that he claimed to have or that anyone in his party claimed to have. He would make the dirtiest of statements. Uh, for example, most recently, um, when he was walking to, I believe it was CPAC, and he was shouting, uh, stop raping to the uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters of the, the um, uh, CPAC uh, meeting. Uh, stop raping, stop murdering, stop raping, because rapes and murders had happened. Um, and whenever you say something like that, you're telling the media that's actually recording this, that that is what is happening all over, not that there's isolated incidents. And that's specifically what he was doing, is trying to spread that idea. And certainly, as a political activist, it's genius, because it gets ignorant people on your side. But as someone who wants to understand perspective and truth, it's infuriating. Because, like this article alluded, it adds to the cloud of smoke around just understanding what reality is. I mean, that's that's really what MSNBC and Fox News are all about, is uh, providing this cloud of delusion for their own particular side's views. That's what's wrong with the world. Uh, you got anything to say on the... <laughs> it sounds familiar. I was just letting you finish your, your tirade there, but it, it makes sense completely, all of it. It just sounds familiar with what's going on with Obama. I'm not a fervent Obama supporter. I did vote for him because... After eight years of Emperor Palpatine in office, you know, <laughs> I mean, come on, you know, there are some people who say it's, you know, you want what's no, good for good. us. And I mean, but really, that's not good for us. It's just good for them. You know, I'm still working the same job. You know, I'm not richer. But Obama gets in the office and like two, not even two years later, people are already bashing him and busting his balls because he hasn't waved the magic wand. And everybody's, you know, now rich driving an SUV or a Hummer. It's like it takes time. And uh, it just seems like... It, it's tough because Obama came in in the... I, I would argue the worst case scenario that a president could come in since, what, Carter? I mean, the economy was shit. The uh, multiple open wars. I'm mean, going to be honest. America has always been involved in a, one form of a conflict or another since the Revolutionary War. We are always supporting the toppling of regimes that are anti-American. We're always having undercover um, uh, subterfuge conflicts to overthrow drug lords, to get pro-America drug lords into power, for example. Uh, Reagan, the Iran-Contra affair. Um, the idea that America is somehow a good guy is a lie. We are the great Satan for a reason. But to your point, Obama came in in the worst case situation. And the the political promises that he made when he was um, being elected into office were based on a world that wasn't active at the moment. Uh, in, in Really, whatever you do as a politician, when you go into politics, you're not 
for the majority, I would like to think, you're not going in to say, hey, I want to fuck over my constituents. You're going in to say, hey, I want to support what I believe is the right thing. I truly believe that even Bush thought that. Though I agree with virtually every single decision he ever made in office. That, I think, was his worldview. Is that he was doing what he thought was right for the country. And that's all Obama is doing. The problem is, is that Bush came in in a time of economic stimulus because of Clinton and turned it into shit that then Obama took over. So y- you, can't, you can't look at Obama as a Bush or you can't look at Obama as a Clinton because they had an, he had an entire disadvantage over their legacies. What I think is going to end up happening is that, you know, years are going to go by. People are going to see Bush for always that Emperor Palpatine figure that you <laughs> very, very cleverly well, I mean, uh, assimilated. But Obama is going to be seen as the new Lincoln. I truly believe that because he, and it's to his detriment because I hate how much he bends to the will of Republicans and the middle ground. He I, does do that. <clears throat> and that's the problem like, I have. Too much. <laughs> modern politics is this guy that we're talking about, Breitbart. It seems like... Um, it's the same thing. Like, you'll watch Fox News, or even with the sound off when I'm at the gym, like on a treadmill, I'm seeing Fox News. It seems like they're painting this picture for your common American to totally buy into the fact that Obama is raping you, you know? It's just like, <laughs> yeah. no, I don't quite buy that. But they're getting people to think this, and it seems like this character, this Breitbart person, was uh, attacking either side, which is something I can relate to because I tend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he know. was actually Breitbart was was really good with attacking the left specifically, um, not necessarily uh, though it included traditional moderate Democrats and traditional moderate Republicans even at times. But his was the the far left, the progressive left. He saw as a disease, and so he made it his own personal, and it may even lead to his downfall ultimately. Personal mission to assault and expose what he perceived as the fault. I have so much dust on my monitor here to be detracted here, a little ADD. It's like ridiculous. We got the sun coming in on here. It's <laughs> so much dust. Um, but yeah, that that was his goal in life was to shut down the progressive left because he saw them as a disease in our world, in our political world. Uh, and I just think that it, if you disagreed with this guy or anyone after they die, it does not mean that you have to be polite or kind or look at them in a good light. Yeah, he had a family. He had children. But you don't have to paint a rosy picture for their sake. Everyone in life has to deal with reality. And I think this is the biggest problem. And this is what everything comes down to. We live in a self-entitled society where everyone has to be a freaking reality star and have big, gigantic, glistening sunglasses. And everyone has to see them as this glorious individual. Well, guess what? The majority of you are shitty human beings that don't really even exist to... Or don't even really deserve to exist. And it sounds mean, but that's the reality behind it. You're never going to amount to anything. You're going to live your life watching MTV, playing video games, and never achieving a damn thing. Never contributing to the greater whole of what human species, what society, what the progression of evolution is. Is that redundant? Progression, evolution? (laughs) It's just the idea that you will never contribute to anything. So why are you special? Why do we give a goddamn about anything that you say or do? And that's what Breitbart stood for in my mind. So don't fucking sugarcoat when someone dies. Let's just all agree that, yeah, every human being has degrees of personality sometimes they're great with their family for example and then when they get in the world view or when they get into the media's eye they turn into pure shitbags that was breitbart i'm sick and tired of people pussyfooting around the legacy someone leaves behind simply because they're gone that doesn't michael mean jackson. shit to me <laughs> what michael jackson whitney Houston. yeah <laughs> like it doesn't make any sense I mean, Michael Jackson was an obscure human being who had an amazing catalog of music, had an unarguably powerful mark on the progression of pop music. I mean, you know, he earned the title he had, but that dude was crazy, like crazy to his core, and there's no way, true or not, true or not, that I would ever let my kids around him. I have no proof that he was a pedophile or just a weirdo or just someone that never grew up or what but the fact that he was so eccentric was enough and Whitney Houston I mean she was a she suffered from a you know what a lot of people call a disease but I'm just gonna say an addiction that she never got over and it got the better of her 
I don't understand why that's a tragedy. That was her own doing. I think everyone... And here's another greater point here that I want to bring up really quick. And I, I may have touched it in the past, so if I have, bear with me here for a second. But there are innate capacities in human beings. Not everyone can be a Leonardo da Vinci. Not everyone can be a Mozart. Not everyone can be a Chopin. Everyone has an innate capacity. That's what makes us, to speak to the demographic here, Satanists. That our capacity is vastly broader than the rest of the herd. So, because there are innate capacities, you have an innate ability to overcome the obstacles that life throws at you of which there are many and very difficult at times. But it is just that uh, intestinal fortitude, if you will, your own individual capacity, your your individual uh, self-actualization that's going to drive you through those shitty shitty experiences. One of the reasons why the uh, Church of Satan is so against drug use is because of addiction and because it dulls your senses to the realities of the world around you. Whitney Houston never got that. It wasn't in her innate capacity to get over that addiction. It's funny that people bring that up and they're trying to blame her ex, Bobby Brown. And I really don't follow all of this stuff, to be honest. But my mom sometimes will have dinner and she'll have like Entertainment Tonight on. I'm like, oh, God, this is (laughs) the most horrendous television show next to Fox News in the world. But they're trying to blame him. And I'm thinking, why are they blaming him? Maybe he did get her into drugs, but... She did it, and she's dead from it. It's not his fault. Just like they got Jackson's doctor in jail. I thought that was the most ridiculous fire. That's like witch burning. <laughs> Seriously. It's the stupidest thing. But it reminds me, and people say, well, living on the road and being famous is tough. It's like, no, it's not. My famous, <laughs> my favorite band is Kiss. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley of Kiss were in the 70s before AIDS before, you know, like some of the drugs we have now are out. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't do drugs. I don't know. I have right. no clue. I'm not hip to drug talk. But <laughs> back then, I'm assuming it was pot and cocaine. Well, these guys never did drugs, never drank, ever. Not once. And they didn't really preach about it in their music. They sang about sex and they <laughs> yeah, had a few songs drinking, about yeah, drinking. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you got to appeal to a certain crowd. But they've lasted all that time up to this day on the road facing all of these vices and temptations while the other two members of kiss spiraled out of control with drugs and you know uh, alcohol and anything you name it they did it and uh, i have the utmost respect for kiss because of that because they have intestinal fortitude as yeah. I put it, and these other pop stars just don't have it you know and they weep and whine about oh it's hard being on the road like so what Kiss has been doing it since 72, and they're still doing it, and they're still drug-free. What's your excuse? You yeah. know? And to speak to that specifically, it's not like they were forced to go on the road. That's their chosen career path. It like, was that was indeed. a dream they had, and then suddenly, oh, it's so hard. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, in the <laughs> 70s, that's what it was about. But yeah. for Gene Simmons, it was just sex and rock and roll. And, uh-huh. You know, people yeah. say what they will about Kiss, but they've stood for that all this time, and that's one of the things I have really admired about them. Yeah, Simmons is, is is certainly the personification of a de facto Satanist. Actually, I mean, it's funny you say that because despite that he's Jewish and from the Middle East, yeah. <laughs> it's he I mean, is. Really, he yeah. literally is. The guy like, is everything he stands for, a, a de facto Satanist. He's come to America and made the dream his, you know, and yeah. people here just kinda don't do it and yeah, yeah, I'm we like, get this kid lazy came from Israel. It's we live in a participation award society and so yeah, it drives me crazy. It's just no one wants to work for anything anymore. And you you look at the people that are successful in life, the people that you see as uh, your 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 heroes, you know, just people you look up to in general. And they had to really freaking work for everything they got. And no one wants to freaking do that anymore. It, it drives me insane. It, it really... All right, we're going to have to get off of that. <laughs> Let's move on to the next one here. And this is actually Huffington Post, so you know it's going to be slanted on the left side here. Ohio school shooting victims. Hundreds honor student Danny Parmerter. Parmerter. Parmesan Erder. Killed in Chardon tragedy. Uh, and, you know, let me say something really quick. Because I've I've talked about a couple of these really tragic news articles. And I've been sort of laughing and giggling the whole way through. And I've talked about in the past why I do that. Uh, I laugh at the futility of analyzing things that I myself do after the fact. Um, The absurdness 
of what brought about their ultimate demise. And we're going to read this and we're going to get into it here in a second. So when I laugh at this, I'm not trying to shit on the people involved. I'm not trying... This, this is all just my own interpretation of the article. Uh, so keep that in mind here. This is Chardon, Ohio. Hundreds of people stood shoulder to shoulder along the street on a cold, windy Saturday morning to honor one of three teenagers killed in a high school shooting. The services in Chardon for 16-year-old Daniel... Parmerton, Parmerton, we're gonna say Parmerton. Parmerton, I guess. <laughs> is the first of three funerals. Services for 16-year-old Demetrius Hewlin will be held. I had no problem with that one. Uh, will be held Tuesday for 17-year-old Russell King Jr. on Thursday. Parmerton's family said the planning to they're planning to bury him with his first paycheck still unopened from his new job at a bowling alley, the Plain Dealer. Oh, what the f- What? They're going to bury him with his first paycheck still on no... What is that... I, what is the motivation? Can you... Maybe you can tell me. What is the motivation for a family to say, Oh, my son died. Let's bury him with his first paycheck. Why, why, why would you think they would do Keep that? in mind, this is news media. They probably didn't give you all the facts here, but I can only guess that he was excited about a new job or something that he was just starting, and that's all he talked about, and then he got killed. I don't... That's what I get out of it. Yeah. I Other than that, that, I have no idea. He Let me really tell you, I mean, the bowling alley, I guess. Knocking on wood here, the, the, <laughs> the tragedy strikes my son. I would not be putting a paycheck in with, like, I, I, the, the idea, the act of a funeral is to celebrate the existence of a human being that was close to you and to memorialize uh, their entire existence. I mean, you think about it, it's a lot to ask for, like, a three-hour event. Like, you're trying to wrap up a whole human being's existence. I mean, this kid was young. so But I, I can't imagine. He was 17-year-old. He was 16-year-old, actually. Um, his first paycheck, that's not that big of a... Like, maybe it's because I came from a family where I was digging ditches um, when I was 14 or 15. In order, I say ditches. I was actually digging out... Uh, uh, Graves. <laughs> <laughs> of my enemies. <laughs> uh, no, it. it was a, a parking uh, a parking space for a, this huge uh, uh, like mobile home from my neighbor. But I was like digging out this hill um, so that I could, because he was paying me, so that I could buy a weightlifting set, my first free weight weightlifting set. It was a big deal for me. But like that was that was huge for me at the time. And maybe you know he was doing something similar to that. But he was 16, okay? Why aren't you doing... Why aren't you mowing lawns? Why aren't you, why don't you have a paper route? This goes to my further point here, that we live in this freaking... Uh, we live in an entitled society. This kid probably... If this is such a big deal, my point is, that his parents would bury him with his first paycheck. That means that's the first time he ever worked for a damn thing in his entire life. I don't want to shit on this particular kid's memory, because that's not really the point of the article here. But if that's the greatest thing in your life, maybe you are a, at 16. At 16, maybe you're not going to have much of a future if you didn't get shot. Like, I'm just saying, I mean, maybe he would have gone on to explain string theory. I, I don't know. But if, if you're 16-year-old, you're getting your first paycheck, and that's such a huge accomplishment that your parents are burying you with it, you that's, didn't live much of a life up until now. That's very Breitbart of you. <laughs> Real Son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just don't understand why that would be the one thing. Like, if you're religious, throw in a religious manual. If, if, if you love to paint, throw in a paintbrush and some paints. But your first paycheck, like that, is so generic. That is, that speaks more about the, your lack of accomplishment in life so far in 16 years of life than anything else. Like. He waited 16 years to get off his ass. Woo! I'd like, I don't get that. Am I not seeing it right? You can only work uh, officially when you're 15 or 16, though. Is that right? By law. But you can still make money. Like, you can still go out. Like, that's why I was saying a paper route. I think that's like like 12, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, you can get a paper route at 12. Uh, you, can, you can go mow lawns as long as you can push the mower. Like, like... Legal, in order to get a paycheck, yes, you have to be X age. And I think it is like 15 or 16. Uh, but because they paid such honor to it in order to bury him with it, they're telling us that that was a huge accomplishment, which tells us as well that he didn't do shit up until that point. 
Like, like he never had a job. He never worked for, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. I'm not even halfway through this article, by the way. Okay, maybe I should So what is the article? I mean, what, what happened? Is this like another Columbine? Because I really don't watch the news. I don't know. Uh, yeah, actually. Um, so uh, we'll, let, let's get through this and, and maybe we'll answer some questions here <laughs> if I can get through it. Um, Palmer's family said they plan to bury him with his first paycheck still and open from his new job at the Bowling Alley Plain Dealer Report. Uh, those honoring the teen wore the school's color of red and black and huddled in hoods knit hats and blankets. They held U.S. flags and signs featuring red hearts and saying, we are one heartbeat. I just had a shudder go down my spine. You know what it really is, really? <laughs> um, it just seems like, and this is again going back to the celebrities and the, all of that, is it just seems like people are comforting each other when somebody dies because it's, you feel bad for the people, who, the family, but really you think in the end this is coming so you don't dare ever say something against it because one day it's going to be you, you know. Or, you know what I mean? I, I think I do. I mean, it, it's sort of and it, it's, it's like almost a maybe thing that you just don't touch. Like you don't yeah. go to work the next day and ask your boss how his sex was with his wife last night or something. Either, you know, maybe you don't. I, I've said it's like I've my made best comments. tips. I've made comments before. You know, I got a big mouth. I'll admit it. Just check me out on Facebook. I piss people off weekly there. So. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm guessing maybe that's kind of like the, I, I do the touchy that. nature of like, and especially like middle America, you know, or even here in Utah, it's like people are like, maybe not here with the Mormons being here. It's a little bit different, but yeah. we are in the twilight zone. But <laughs> that's what, that's kind of what I'm getting out of all of this is just, it's like a kid. I mean, it's a tragic situation too. Kid shot yeah, in school. Yeah, that's really what it's about is people are banding together, but. And there's a, and that's the other thing is that there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you're going into it knowing what you're getting into, what drives me crazy, and, and maybe this is just the, the narcissist in me, that when people go to a funeral, uh, when and I've, I've talked about this in very early episodes here, when people experience um, a death that's personal to them, they capitalize on it. Um, and it's almost that idea that the harder you cry, the more other people pay attention to you. Oh, he must have meant so much more to this person. And so the more you get out of someone else's death. Like, at some point, I truly believe that, 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 that the person that died, their story ends and it's the survivor's story suddenly. And just the fact that we term that idea survivor. Oh, well, his father survived him with his brother and sister and survive what does that mean like okay let's break it down you're still breathing but that's because you weren't there in front of the gun like there is not an accomplishment to being a survivor that literally means nothing has happened to you and if we're gonna celebrate nothing happening well then we're all great and we're all wonderful and everyone you know here's your living life award and never having dared to do anything dangerous or questionable. What the fuck is that? That, that like that's not even. If, if that's what we did in our earliest versions of human experience, we would never be where we are now. We would never have dared cross the oceans. We would never have gotten out of our fucking cave, for that matter. Like we would have, we would be gone the way of the dodo. But it is our, our to our detriment, our desire to face danger, to fight against the unknown, to explore it until it is known, to question all things, a very satanic tenet there, that makes us human beings. And when you do that, you see fuckers like this, who have lived 16 fucking years, and their greatest accomplishment is their first paycheck. It's an insult to what it means to be a human being in my eyes, and that's maybe why where I'm coming from when I get so infuriated about it. It's, <laughs> it's that idea that... <laughs> What the fuck happened to being a human being? Like, like struggling for your survival. Like fighting for, for a new experience and, and to say fuck you to mediocrity. Express yourself and be something. Don't just have your greatest accomplishment at 16 be a paycheck? Okay, now I, see, heard, now you... I see where you're going with this. So, in other words, you're kind of trying to say that they're remembering him as the kid who got his first paycheck, and that that was it. Instead of burying him with uh, a painting that he may have done when he was eight, you know, or, <laughs> yeah. is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, like like that is his greatest. 
that is his greatest gift to all of mankind in the life. Let that me he just lived. give you two words here that might put that into perspective. Right. Walmart. <laughs> That's America for you these days. That's it. <laughs> If, if you've ever seen so the sad people of Walmart or gone into yeah. a Walmart, this is the kind of people that mainly populate America. That's why it's so oh. easy to be a Satanist here and go, look at me, they dance around me. Ah, they're all so dumb. Ah. <laughs> you know, I hate to think like that, but sometimes when you go to places like that, and in Utah, with the Mormons around here, it's yeah. it's uh, really, I've heard the mentality <laughs> here, it really is, literally. Uh, they And they know it. Oh. Uh. So it's it's like a deathist culture that we live in. It's like my mother is a Catholic, and she's really into like this person's dying. It's all she talks about is church. Like this person's dying. This guy has cancer. It's always something miserable and terrible. <laughs> and this guy, there's a funeral, and I gotta go to this funeral, and people are gonna stand around mm-hmm. and weep. And I remember my dad when I was a little kid at a funeral. And I, I think my cousin died. And he was my age. He was like Jeez. three or four at the time. I'm, everybody was kneeling down and praying, which I even then thought was kind of dumb. I'm like, why am I <laughs> kneeling down like this? This is so undignified. I'm a kid, you know, but I see my dad walking around in circles, kind of pacing around. So I thought, I'm going to be cool like my dad. And I ran up and walked around with him. And he just patted me on the head. And that's it. You know, I, for me, a funeral is like, they were great in life. I miss them, but, you know, I don't <laughs> see the point of standing around for three hours and just, you know, oh, my God, oh, you know, it's just <laughs> celebrate who they were. You know, yeah. I, I'm guessing that's kind of a satanic funeral standpoint, but. Yeah, very much so, I think. Not, not to sit around and weep and cry that they're gone and try and affix blame to somebody who may have killed yeah. them by prescribing too many painkillers or something, <laughs> you know. It's just, that's where America seems to be at these days, unless it, I guess, with famous people. But. Yeah, for sure. Um, let, let me try to get through this article. It's not actually a couple more paragraphs here. Um, parameter, parameter, I can't ever there say you this go. right, was remembered as a computer whiz and for his laugh and wit, WJW TV reported. You know it's true when a TV station reports it. <laughs> it's got to be true. Two other students were seriously wounded when a gunman opened fire in the cafeteria at Chardon High School about 30 miles east of Cleveland. One remains in serious condition. A second has been released from the hospital. The mass was held at the Church of St. Mary across the street from the school complex where the attack occurred. It's the same church where thousands showed up for a vigil earlier in the week. On Friday, hundreds had waited in cold rain to pay respects to the teen at a funeral home in nearby East Lake. He was to be buried at Chardon Cemetery. Charges filed in a juvenile court accused 17-year-old T.J. Lane of aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and felony assault. Lane's next hearing is Tuesday. Prosecutor David Joyce said the motive for the shooting remains unclear. He said the victims were selected randomly, and he called the suspects someone, quote, who's not well, end quote. Um, prosecutor David Joyce, quote, is a douchebag. End quote. Like that, that goes without saying. Someone who's going to walk into a cafeteria at high school and just randomly shoot people with no connection. Well, obviously, it goes without, literally, they, they have the saying, goes without saying, because you don't have to say it. Like, it's obvious. <laughs> Classes resumed at the 1,100 student school on Friday with police on hand. That's the article. Uh, <laughs> I think that's going to have to do it for this Infernal Informant. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, man. Uh, coming up next in the Creature Feature is Witch Sarah Rung with the interview uh, about her online store, The Still Show. Stay tuned. Oh, God. No. Just me. <laughs> Did you know that after the heart stops beating, the brain can function for well over seven minutes? We got six more minutes to play. (coughs) Why are you screaming when I haven't even cut you yet? Welcome to Creature Feature. Welcome to another Creature Feature. Today I have a very special guest. I'm talking with Witch Sarah Run from The Still Show and various online outlets. I'm sure you've heard of her. Sarah, how are you today? Thank you so much for joining me. I am doing wonderful, Mr. Campbell. How are you? (laughs) Uh, Fantastic. I asked you to be on the show for a number of reasons. One, I saw some of your handiwork, and I was really sort of taken aback. You have this uh, dark sensibility in the the pieces that you've put out there. 
Uh, I was really intrigued by it. I reached out to you a little bit uh, to see if uh, it was for sale, if, if any of your products were for sale. And you had uh, mentioned that you were creating a storefront, which is known as, I, I presume, the Still Show. And I, I sort of wanted to have on the show to talk to you uh, about that. Also, in some of the previous interviews I've done with other people, they have recommended you to come on the show and to talk about um, yourself as you were a, a very interesting uh, individual and um, certainly worthy of discussion. So, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? That is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and on all fronts, thank you very much. Most people, if they are familiar with my work to any extent, they probably heard of my former company, which was called Female Addictions, and... That was started in 2004, and it was one of those things where I I was excited about it, and it was very about the creative process of everything, And but I didn't know a lot about the business, marketing, everything that went along with it at that time, mm-hmm. um, and it had success, you know, as far as a niche market right away, I just had not put the whole kind of um, deliberate into everything that I should have because I didn't know it would have success, if that makes any sense. And it was a word I kind of made up. So with that, there was a lot of confusion. 2007, I decided to open a brick and mortar storefront. And with that, it had my creations and it had um, things by other artists, friends of mine, also, like, I don't know, wind-up teas and finger traps and, like, mm. voodoo suckers and just... I wanted it to be sort of like the magic shop in Pee-wee's Big Adventure meets Twin Peaks. <laughs> Red <Nice. room>. So, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But at that at period of time in my life, I was kind of doing a little bit too much. It got to where I did creative things so much that I just grew to just not even want to do it at all. So, I took sort of a hiatus. And during the hiatus, I kind of learned a little bit more about marketing and branding. And I'm fortunate enough to have some friends that specialize in those fields. And they've been giving me a lot of um, constructive criticism and feedback and things like that. And I thought that the still show was a really great kind of black umbrella under which to operate. It's an antiquated term for a dime museum, and with that it fit everything I make, because I make all sorts of things, and it it varies kind of from day to day. Is it something that you schedule what to work on on a day to day, or or do you decide to work on a specific type of um, project? Uh, Next week I'm going to work on that type. It, It really, it tries to be the first and I, I try to go for the second, <laughs> <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Otherwise, I just, it, it would be not as organized chaos. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, you do offer a lot of different types of, of products. Um, I mean, it ranges from, like, perfumes, correct, mm-hmm. to, to, like, uh, I mean, dolls and even, like, I don't know, would you call it, like, statuary? I mean, some of this, some of your dolls aren't really, like, play-with-it type stuff, you know? Yeah, I, like the um, art assembly dolls, and I love stuff like that. It's just the whole intricacy, and I've, I've never been one to be very good at mass-producing things, and so that's why everything has sort of a short run. But with that, there's, I think, a real intimacy to everything. I, with everything I make, I've wanted it to seem, because it is, like a gift from one friend to another friend. And with that, it will always be a niche market. I'm okay with that. <laughs> As a businesswoman, is that, was that ever a large concern for you? Like, uh, because you're catering to a specific demographic, well, then there's X amount to be made um, financially. So... I mean, is, is that is that a concern, or, or do you do this more because of the passion? I do it primarily for the passion, and it's, um, I'd say it's 
almost entirely the passion, and when the passion goes, everything else goes. You know, I, I, I do everything more for the process than the end result or money is as egalitarian and hippie as that probably sounds. It, it's more of, it's for myself more so, but when people happen to enjoy it, that's just sort of like a cherry atop the sundae. It's really like, oh, yay, you like that. Mm -hmm. really, yay, cool. <laughs> we probably have all sorts of silly things in common, and, you know, and it's, it's almost like um, in, a, in a world that's more and more connected, people are less and less making actual real connections, it seems. Like, people are more apt to even if they live in the same town and they're good friends, they seem a lot more apt to just not talk and just type all the time and just, I like that, but I don't like that at the same time. And it's, it, it just seems like anything resembling intimacy will, will have more and more value as far as um, the world going in the direction it is. It'll become all the more rare. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, I don't think I've ever really thought of uh, anything I do. I mean, I, to be quite honest, everything I do, because I'm a graphic designer, is directed toward the masses. So mm -hmm. it, it's always amazing to me. I, it, it's sort of like uh, watching watching an artist who you uh, you know have respect for their work and, and you, you really like the aesthetic that they're presenting in their work, just watching them paint. You know, on one hand, you're like, well, you know, this is amazing. It's, it's beyond what I am capable of. And so you appreciate it for that. But you never really think that, you know, there's this, I never really think that there's this uh, mass appeal for it. And so on one level, because I'm such a realist, I'm like, well, at what point does creating art for art's sake um, begin and end with the reality of the world we live in. And for someone like you to sort of take that idea and say, well, it doesn't really matter because I'm doing this for my passion. And as soon as I stop concerning myself with that, uh, well, then I stop working. I mean, it's it's such a different place for, for my mind. I think it's amazing that, that, that you can do that and... Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I would be so worried <laughs> about every little thing. You know what I mean? Like, what if this doesn't sell, or what do I have to create next to keep selling? And I, I, I admire that that sort of um, uh, focus on the work. You know? Well, I it, it really is something I have to force myself to stick with. It's, you know, um, I I've had long periods of time when I've done you know really traditional work and as a supplement done, you know, made things, and with that, I had, you know, the safety net and the structure and things like that, but I was too tired or distracted or anything like that to just work. Luckily, while I was during those periods of time, I amassed a great deal of stuff. Like, I, I wasn't a big spender or anything, but I any money I did make above my living expenses and at this point it's just myself and two kitty cats and I'm a pretty minimalistic girl um, that money I would invest into more art supplies or just kind of weird oddities and toys and things like that I used to buy whole collections of just really as far as like the people that like those things it's mm -hmm. like oh you have like four of that and <laughs> So with that, I have um, kind of a built-in weird savings account that, yeah. you know, if I, so my process is more that I kind of am, am sort of a go-to girl as far as like, oh, Sarah has, you know, how many packs of like coyote leg bones and multiples of this or that vinyl or whatever. And so there's sort of the, I don't know, go-to girl aspect for a good deal of my income and other than that you know and she makes really neat stuff and <laughs> <laughs> so I've kind of got it arranged the way I like it finally where yeah. it's kind of balanced between the two extremes 
Where do you think that comes from? I mean, not not really concerning yourself with with cash in hand, but more the uh, the, the retaining of of art or objects that can be used for just pure aesthetic. Well, I like to say I'm not a pack rat. I'm an archivist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I think every Satanist has a great deal of that in them, and it just manifests differently. Yeah. Well, uh, since you, since you mentioned it, um, can you maybe tell us where you first, uh, w- how you were first exposed to Satanism? Um. Yeah, I was. Well, I'm originally from a really small town in central Louisiana, the kind of area that's um, equal parts. Catholic, Southern Baptist, and Assembly of God, and oh. oddly enough, I didn't have that much religion um, in my family. I mean, like, the Pope was on TV at Christmas and stuff like that, and a couple of, um, I think maybe a total of, like, two times in my life I was made to do something or another religious, but the majority, obviously the overwhelming majority of people around me were religious Uh, so it was more of a they would be able to recognize that I was not like them and they're the ones that had a problem with that it it's sort of like we always have to be the considerate ones (laughs) is how I've always sort of thought of it and they can just act you know like fat kids throwing fits in the cereal aisle of the store when they don't get the reaction they like I actually first heard of things like that from being called derogatory terms by people that didn't actually understand the connotations of those words. And I'm also what can kind of happen when you don't have a lot of supervision. Like, I'm, you know, I'm a kid of the 80s and a single mom, um, stuff like that. And so I was kind of left to my own devices to a certain extent so I watched stuff and read stuff and things like that you know that a lot of kids didn't I read the satanic bible I was probably 12 or 13 or something like that and the only thing that I had to sort of become better about was when I initially read it I said everybody knows this and I didn't recognize how special it all really was because I was young and it's still something I sort of have to keep myself in check about but I gave people too much credit and I was like oh everybody knows this this Mm -hmm. is no big deal at the same time I had kind of a hard time with magic wrapping my head around magic because I have never been someone to believe anything I can't see you know and um so it was with age and experience that I was like, oh, hmm, not really, no one knows this stuff, but I do, and that's sort of further affirmation that this book is for me, and all of the other ones too, and that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so from a young woman uh, reading this and, I don't know, just, just digesting it, allowing it to sort of just be a part of your worldview, at what point did you yeah. decide... Um, you wanted to join the organization. Well, I I am very much the sort of person that really does not join things. I did not join until the age of probably 26. And during that period of time, other than, you know, other real life things, I I thoroughly studied Satanism and sort of the world's religions and things like that. And it wasn't to find something better or anything like that. It was just to fully, I guess, affirm that it was what it said it was. Because before joining the Church of Satan, I didn't know any other um, members or anything like that. My husband at the time identified as a Satanist and joined a few years after I did. But, you know... Neither of us knew any Church of Satan members and things like that. And so it was sort of very much on the outside looking in of everything. And that was sort of with the big advent of the Internet. And it seemed to me like, okay, there's the Church of Satan and then there's everything else. And I really like the idea of this. 
let me just make sure. And so I read about things, you know, like the Yazidis and things like that. And and because the people on the outside like to kind of use our terminology out of context and coattail. And, and I was able to sort of trace historically that everything associated with Satanism and the Church of Satan was true. And um, that you know, no other group of people before 1966 deliberately applied this term to themselves. It was otherwise very much an insult and things like that. And so once I had my research done for my own self, I joined and uh, really wished I'd done so sooner, but, you know. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me interrupt you really quick. Oh. Because you say you wish you did it sooner. Do, is that because of of the people that you've met since joining? Yes, yes. And, and that it really was, because I, I just didn't expect it to be, you know, there's advertising and then there's actuality and then there's something that doesn't necessarily have to really advertise. But you've read everything about it and you've seen documentaries and things like that and you've seen what people that, uh, you know, represented have done and things like that. And you're just like, wow, this is actually as nifty as I thought it would be. <laughs> and then some. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the the greatest um, realizations I've had personally with uh, the Church of Satan is is seeing the claim that it's a mutual admiration society of the alien elite um, in reality. Like, you know, it's easy to throw that term out there for any club or group or, or anything like that, and, you know, each individual member takes it at face value. But when you see people of accomplishment and uh, they are like you, and, you know, you genuinely, whether or not you had ever heard of the word Satanism, you would still have looked up to the work that they're producing or the music or whatever that medium is. And so now you suddenly have something, you know, at your core in common with these people. Uh, it, I don't know. It's, it's really an amazing feeling that, wow, I'm, one, I'm not alone. And two, it, it is everything that it purported itself to be. Yeah, definitely. Almost, I'm lucky enough, you know, that almost all of my best friends are also Church of Satan members, but at the same time there's that whole odd kind of chicken and the egg thing where it's it's a lot of times the last thing we talk about, mm -hmm. and we would be friends anyway. It's just sort of like how the hell else would we have found one another, really? Well, let's uh, let's turn a little bit back to your, your work here, um, if we can. I mean, okay. you first created your, your first exercise in, in, in commercial retail, I suppose I could say, um, in 04, right? Yes. So what is it that inspired you to do that? I mean, you are very much, you know, an imaginer and creator of, of really uh, original works. What What is it that really sort of, you know, where's that fire inside of you come from? Well, um, I initially... Well, I guess as far as answering the direct question, um, the person that probably had the most of an influence on me growing up was my maternal grandfather, and um, he was albino and legally blind and widowed when my mother, who was his youngest, was um, nine years old. And talk about learn about there is no excuse for anything, you know, <laughs> and... I mean, he ran circles around supposedly able-bodied people, and um, he had businesses and did side businesses aside from his businesses, like, <laughs> you know, all kind of, you know, um, and when he wasn't doing that, he was making amazing food and, you know, just making sure everything was up to par at all times, and, um, and up until a few years ago, I was um, legally blind was just sort of preparing for a life of eventually being blind and thankfully technology 
fix that and completely actually reverse that. And But before that, I had, you know, 29 years of my life being that way. And oh, my gosh. And he and I had a very special connection. And he always told me, there's no reason you can't do anything you don't want to do. Don't, the two things in life I cannot do are drive a car and read a newspaper. And I bought myself a big-ass car. And I make other people <laughs> drive me around. And a big-screen TV. So I don't need no newspaper. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's, you said it's a year ago you, you had that your, your eyes fixed? Oh, it was actually now about four years ago. Okay, so yeah. four years ago you had your vision corrected, I should say, not not fixed. I would say fixed. They were pretty broken. <laughs> <laughs> so was it, was it, I mean, did you have, did you have, like, shadows of light that you could see, or was it just pure darkness? Um, I had, with best correction, in my, you know, meaning glasses or contacts or whatever, in my left eye, I had about 30% of my vision, and my right eye was able to recognize light from dark and that was about it and um so they fixed that primarily by taking out all of the not beneficial stuff and I have actually in each eye I have two implants and each of the implants have a prescription and if you see them in the right light they look like little bitty diamonds it's really kind of neat wow that's incredible and (laughs) <laughs> what I, what I find amazing, besides the this really, I mean, just the individual strength that you have to have to not fall into, uh, you know, a, a depression or or just a, a give up attitude. I mean, your, your your grandfather really must have really helped you and in, in yeah, provided a great I mean, example. He was hilarious, and he he just was such a a standard that almost everyone around him just failed just by being around him, you know, like, <laughs> people that had all of their supposed abilities and mm-hmm. everything going for them. It was very much, he was my earliest example of, you know, drive is more than anything else. So with 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 your vision impaired that severely for so many years of your life, and then suddenly being able to see, wh- where do you think you're getting your your visual aesthetic from? I mean, where does that come from? Because you do have a very, very distinct look. Your work is very distinct, and uh, I mean, it's macabre. It's 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 dark. It's exciting. It's a little bit scary at times. Where does that come from? Oh, thank you. Um, I think it is a combination of kind of where I grew up and what I was exposed to at a really early age and also what I've always been interested in and where I grew up is, you know, sort of everything associated with the almost mythology of Louisiana and... <laughs> like the voodoo um, side of her or, I mean... Um, just kind of everything lumped together, like, because it, it it's, it's in the central part of the state and so this were kind of all of those things overlap and meet and kind of are at war with one another. Mm. Like the neighborhood I grew up in, literally there was a a mental institution where people were sort of allowed to roam free a lot of the time. Oh. And if you turn and if you turned in one of your relatives, you had your choice of a ham or like a turkey. What? A block from <laughs> you know, a few blocks from there there was a charity hospital <clears throat> and then Right around the same area, there's three cemeteries, one of which is the oldest in the parish, and surrounding all of that is working class at best level of income and sort of the, I don't want to say desperation that accompanies that, but just a lot of elements all at once that just sort of show you a lot about humanity and how they'll just kind of fall over one another and jump over to being compulsive and and then with that you know like the voodoo stuff you hear about and the the -the over-the-top religious stuff you hear about and the food being amazing and (laughs) just this really weird mixture of stuff I also like I think with that like my first ever memory of anything was being three years old like my most vivid memory is being three years old and watching a cat give birth to and then eat her own kittens. Holy shit. And just 
staring at this with like what am I watching here and my Aunt Linda explained to me the entire time like she's doing that because there's something wrong with her babies and it's the kinder thing to do even though it doesn't seem that way and so I did have a lot of you know early on adults kind of knew they could talk to me in a realistic manner and that I would understand do you think that was something within you that they sensed or was that something just within themselves I think it was something that they sensed with me because I really realized that when I got to school (laughs) yeah (laughs) by then I had seen all these silly things and I saw with that how much of a sort of a I didn't know the terminology then, but how much of a lesser magic for my for my own fun of it sort of thing that could be, mm. you know, if, if just being on the playground and things like that and someone, I don't know, annoying me. And I could be like, you know, the woods over there, there's this guy and he's got an axe and he escaped from the <laughs> institution and he's like going after the people like you. And, and they would just, you know, they had never had anything like that enter their worldview, ever, and so they just believed me like morons, and... <laughs> <laughs> that's <is> great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's part of where the playfulness kind of comes in, if there's any playfulness or silliness yeah. with me and what I do. Um, can, I, can I touch on that a little bit deeper here? You had mentioned early on when you were looking into the, the Satanic Bible or, or Satanism itself that you had a hard time wrapping your head around the idea of magic because you were such a realist and stuff. So yeah. is that something that you still are are having issue with or, or have you sort of resolved that? Have you? I, because I, I do know of Satanists who really just don't concern themselves with that part of Satanism. Um, I think I resolved that before I joined, and, it, and it's just my own sort of take on everything, because I very much see magic. I, I really feel that the more proficient you are at lesser magic, the less the need for greater magic. Yeah. First of all, and for me, magic is sort of a state of mind and the ritual chamber is the mind and if you I mean aesthetically I love things like that but magic really does necessitate a portability I mean what sort of a you know magician are you if you have to have your stuff to like do anything with it and so and also just kind of a measure of how successful you are at it is how good are you at getting what you want Mm -hmm. you know and it's all but for me it's more than anything like a state of mind and that I deliberately sort of put myself in where you know if I'm making you know licorice vanilla caramels for the boy I like I'm thinking of him the entire time and he'll know that (laughs) nice how about we move a little bit more into some of your uh, your projects uh, specifically? Okay. Of everything that you offer, what do you think is the most fun for you to make? Oh, the most fun would definitely be, right now, in the past couple of years, um, dolls. Because I've always done all sorts of different types of art, but the one thing I couldn't do before... Um, my eyes were fixed, um, was sew. No one had ever taken the time to show me how to sew. And so that was like the one skill I didn't have that I couldn't do. And so once I was able to teach myself how to do that, I just did nothing but that. Like, Mm. yay, I'm going to do this and that. And things like that are so small to most people. But, you know, when you, when you haven't been able to do something and you all of a sudden can, it's just, for me at least, it's, just like a glee associated yeah. with it and um I've always loved dolls especially you know I, I think of like I don't know magic with Anthony Hopkins or um night gallery episodes certain things like that and there's definitely the whole correlation to artificial human companions and yeah. 
it's a lot of fun and everyone I mean the possibilities are pretty much endless and especially if you have worked in several different um, techniques and things like that and you can kind of see how you can meld them all together and create this little creature and <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you've been posting a number of photos uh, online, and I've been looking at some of these, just sort of uh, taking them back, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> what, because they're not, I mean, it's not like uh, like a full baby doll, for example. Uh, you know, you have stuff that's sort of like a, a, like a plush um, doll, but then also like, uh, speaking specifically here to your um, uh, little devil with the pitchfork, uh, it has like, you know, this... I don't know, like a little metal pitchfork in this little plush looking doll's hand. So it creates this sort of juxtaposition of texture and um, visually it's it's very jarring. Uh, very, very interesting. Not something that I would necessarily um, give to a kid because I'd be afraid they'd tear it up, you know, just by playing with it normally. But, you know, for, for just to have on your own, I think is really, really interesting. And another one that I am... Uh, pretty damn speechless about is your two-headed mummified baby <laughs> this thing before you put it together and and did a little photo shoot i think i saw uh, pictures of the uh the baby itself um just sort of alone and this is something that i mean it's like it's like in my head for nightmares type stuff i mean it's <laughs> it's it's like it's scary just to visually look at but then you don't want to look away because you want to really understand it with your eyes and it, it sort of you can't. Can we speak to this for just a second? What was sort of, what was it that made you create this piece, the two-headed mummified baby? That is actually a really neat story, as far as I'm concerned, um, and it kind of it ties a lot of things together as far as my interests and things like that. I have a really real interest in humans and how they would more likely be cruel to one another than do work and th those are inspired by a creature from Thailand called Loke Koj and it's L-O-O-K-E K-O-G-E I might be pronouncing it wrong it's not mm -hmm. or you know the sort of thing you hear pronounced every day but that's my <laughs> best pronunciation but those were sold those were actually originally made with like real stillborn babies Holy and shit. people would go to you know the sort of guy that the shaman or whatever you would call him and be like I need something for good luck and he they would request a loke coach and he would say okay well what kind of you know aesthetically what do you want it to look like and um, he would bend it on a wire and he would put it over fire and it, it would be wrapped in cloth and it would be smoked until it was mummified and people would carry around these little dead babies what the for fuck? good luck and they were given all of these instructions like you know you have to treat it like it's a real child and you have to give it sweets and <laughs> you know um, it's, it's a good idea if you set it a plate for it at the table and things like that and treat it like part of the family and it will give you good luck and grant wishes and if you don't treat it this way it'll sort of come after you and if you have any other children in the home there will be a rivalry and so it's just all of this just extensive crap you know that and cruelty I mean for the purpose of good luck and the irony of that to me is just <laughs> sadly hilarious oh and, yeah I love that story I've never heard that before you know no one else I've ever known has ever heard that story either so they were they were originally made that way and then obviously for very you know I don't know common sense legal reasons that was sort of um, <laughs> discontinued <Yeah>. and, <laughs> and then they kind of tried to do the same thing with other materials they would make them out of um, like temples that were turned down, they would carve them out of that wood. Like anything that had any sort of, ooh, this is really special. Mm -hmm. And and I just like to make them out of paper mache, personally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and no one be harmed. And, 
you know, because it doesn't really matter what something is made of, it's the power you give it. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to go get stillborn babies. You can totally use paper mache and paint. It's okay. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Are you creating these for the same, um, the same story that, that they originally were created for? Yeah, I, well, kind of on the realistic line between the extremes, I, tr- I, I kind of tried to tell the story and what they were originally intended for and also have it be aesthetically what it should be. Mm-hmm. It should be terrifying, but kind of cute. <laughs> and I let people know that they decide on their own what anything means, and yeah. they should decide for themselves. That's, that's the biggest thing I've always tried to tell people is um, they should decide what magic is. Like, like with a lot of the things I make, people want me to tell them how to use it. And if I was not the sort of person I was, I would probably be a lot more rich by now <laughs> because I would have no problem doing that. Yeah. But but I would rather, let, you know, probably be the first person ever to tell them, like, well, if you want to use it for that, great. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You know, you're the one that decides what magic is. Mm. It's stories like that. Um, uh that's the reason I actually started delving into the cult when I was a kid. Um, it, that idea that you can tap into these unknown authorities, you know, that that sort of sit in the back room of reality that will yeah. grant you and things. I so much about people. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I I'm obsessed with ideas like that uh, because, as as a species, you know, talking in terms of of psychology and evolution of, of our minds that's you know that that's the center of where we really started it's it's these right. ideas and and that's really where I, I prefer to live the most of my time <laughs> right. I mean I understand reality around me and I'm, I'm very happy with where I am in my life and everything but I still love to fall back on stuff you know and it, it's sort of done through movies and fiction writing and stuff like that nowadays but you know that's what sort of started it all so seeing a doll like this I, I think I think I might have to get one now because of the story behind it. I love I like you can I'm obsessing here a little bit, but you can see sort of uh, indication of features on here and almost like one of them maybe like almost sucking a thumb or it's just so <laughs> creepy and amazing looking. And with that story behind it, holy shit, I think everyone should be getting some of these. These are awesome. <laughs> Um, before we sort of wrap this up, I did also want to talk to you about um, your hand blended perfume oils. Now, this is something that has, in in my personal experience with friends, been a really challenging avenue to try to undertake, but also at the center of what it means to be a witch, uh, sort of controlling the aroma and, through that, the perceptions of others around you. Um, what was the impetus for you uh, mixing your own perfumes and oils and stuff? Well, when I was really little... I remember my mother had um, what was called a solid perfume, and and I didn't really know what it was called, but it was something that was on her vanity, and it was one of the really scant few high-end things in our home, and it was this beautiful metal tin that was, you know, like metal and enamel and just really foo-foo, and um, every once in a while, she would let me have a little bit of it, and so I remembered the consistency very specifically and then when I grew up and I tried to find something like that I wasn't able to find it all I was able to find was junk from like you know department stores that was like overblown lip balm you know and Mm -hmm. trying to be sold as being the same thing and so that is what initially made me like I'm going to figure out how to make this because I really miss these and I initially had 10 different Scents and solid perfumes were my only product type, and I didn't expect, you know, I made them for myself, and other people would comment on them everywhere I went, and so I was like, well, what the hell, I'll see if anyone wants to buy them, and by the end of that year, I had already grown to where I had oils and um, creams and 
just like the full line of everything because I just whatever profits I made I reinvested back in mm -hmm. and I kind of let the people you know say oh well could, you know could you consider making this and and so with that I also um, soap making was a lot of fun and that's that's this the one thing other than the oils that people seem to really go really crazy over because like with my dolls it's kind of similar with my soaps like for the time I made Dexter blood slide soaps <laughs> and I've made anatomical heart soaps oh wow that, like life size you know and just, just made it all ridiculous like <laughs> that's great <laughs> Where can people go to learn a little bit more about the products you offer and to see the Still Show itself? Um, right now, it is at thestillshow.squarespace.com. It's fantastic. And is that the best way for people to contact you regarding the Still Show? Yes. Um, I have the email address on there, which is thestillshow at gmail.com, and there's a link to the Facebook page. Do you take custom work requests? I love custom requests. Oh, yeah, really? a lot of fun. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. I actually might have a couple then because <laughs> after seeing what you're <laughs> capable of, I, I've got some ideas brewing in my head. Well, there you have it, people. Um, check out The Still Show. It is worth stopping by for sure, but these are one-of-a-kind pieces of art that, and like I said, one-of-a-kind. You're not going to find them anywhere else. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. It has been a true pleasure. Thanks for joining me. I hope we can talk again. And I certainly do want to have you back on to talk a little bit more about um, ritual and magic, if you'd uh, indulge me. Oh, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Great. Well, until then, hail Satan. Hail Satan. Uh, and that's it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. FXD, thank you so much for joining me, man. Thank you, sir, and for the wonderful homebrewed... Delicious beer. goodness. <laughs> uh, Belgian white. And we actually tried the Swartz beer, which uh, in another two weeks I think is going to be uh, fully aged. It'll be pretty good. And uh, for you, the listener, I hope you enjoyed it, and I would love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. And if you want to scream at me for mocking the death of other people, uh, I welcome it. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show at RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. You can also subscribe via iTunes by searching 9 cents and don't forget to leave a rating and a comment. And like I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, thank you those who have left a review. I truly appreciate it. And if you haven't left a rating or comment, maybe you should uh, get off your ass. That's all I'm saying. You know, help me out. Yeah. If you'd like to learn more about the church saying, <laughs> help him out. Come on. Can't you see what he's saying here? See? He understands. Stop in the line. Actually, it's true. It is true. And I have, uh, when you're doing something, like, and you put it online, it's you want to hear some feedback, and when nobody does, it just drives you crazy, So because you don't know if you're doing it good, or if you're doing it bad, or what, so. Yeah, honestly, if you hate my show, let me know. Shit, your negative feedback is going to help me make it better. And if any of you want his address, I'm at his house right now. Just email <laughs> me later. <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit Church of Satan. I'm, I've been spitting through this entire episode. I'm surprised you were so clean. I'm like the oh, I'm man. the Gallagher of podcasts, uh, <laughs> showering the audience with my spit. Uh, if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, musical personalities, visit RadioFreeSatan.com and online streaming radio station. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, and for FXT, until next week, Hail Satan! Hail Satan!